<laughs> Michael and I worked hard last night to get his presentation put together, so we've got a, a really great PowerPoint presentation here, well, great slide presentation here that we put together. But I wanted to, uh, I, mean, I think a lot of you are, are very uh, aware of who Michael is, you know him, you've probably taken classes with him, you've met him at different events. Kirkley. Um, I'm really excited that he agreed to do this for us, and I apologize to you that it's been so, so long to get this done. But um, I want to want to give you a little bit of background on, on Michael. So can and I, Rebecca Horn. Can I elaborate on how great you are just for a little bit? <laughs> I love it. Keep going. All right. <laughs> it's all live. Keep going anyway. We'll, we'll, we'll talk about the panel later. But <laughs> Um, Michael, Michael earned his BFA in fine art from the University of South Carolina in 1975, and he later traveled to New York studying pastel and oil painting uh, under internationally known artist Daniel Green. Today, Michael is an award-winning artist and member of Oil Painters of America and the Southeastern Pastel Society. He guest lectures, juries, art shows, and regularly teaches oil, acrylics, and pastel painting throughout the United States. He's conducted numerous workshops at uh, such prestigious art centers as Huntsville Museum of Art, Hudson River Valley, workshops in Greenville, New York, John C. Campbell Folk School in Brasstown, and we could mention lots and lots of others. I personally have taken classes years ago with Michael, and I credit him uh, for giving me a good start in pastels. Yeah, you're doing good with pastels. Thank you, Michael. <laughs> <laughs> but Michael was very influential in my development as an artist, and his, his workshops are great. He's an amazing teacher. He's very patient and very kind. <laughs> Especially when Talk you're just- Talking about me? Yes, I am. <laughs> So um, he's also showcased in the Bush Presidential Library in Houston, Texas, and his paintings have been reproduced by major publishers such as Canadian <coughs> Art Prints of British Columbia and distributed worldwide. <coughs> I'm excited for his topic to, tonight, and I think we will all find great value in this regardless of whatever medium we use. Michael's well-versed in multiple mediums, so I know he'll be speaking from, from that standpoint. But during this presentation, he's actually going to discuss his approach to his oil and pastel paintings. And he often starts with a tone charcoal drawing as a guide, and I'm well versed in that. He taught me that, as a guide to establishing the dark. I love the title of his presentation, Don't Be Afraid of the Darks. It starts with the dark. Michael's going to explain his process of layering color to avoid overblending, which is one of my sins, and applying mid-tone and highlight color without losing your all-important darks. And he has a great handout if you haven't already picked it up at the table, please do so. Uh, some of his tips to understanding how to paint reflections. I'm going to turn it over to Michael and let him run with it, and I think you'll find a lot of this information very useful. Thank you, Michael. Right, thank you. Uh, thanks for coming. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, sorry, the sorry, the uh, so they're not able to see, or they are seeing it at home. They, they are. Zoom is not. Zoom, Zoom is not. It's yeah. on. Okay. Right. Um, anyways, the. Uh, you know, when you give talks, you, you try to think, well, what can I do different? You know, it, it's, it seems like it's so easy to just repeat yourself, and then you get tired of hearing yourself talk, let alone everybody else. But I was teaching a class in Huntsville, Alabama, and and I was talking to this one artist about, don't paint your darks out, you know, pay attention to the darks. And, you know, finally at the end of the day, she said, it's all you talk about is the darks. Because, you know, you need to make your class give it a title, like, don't be afraid of the darks, you know? So that, I thought, that's, I like that idea, you know? So maybe I'll do some classes and let that be the theme. So it made me think about my own paintings, and I thought, you know, if you're gonna talk about something like this, I guess you, it's good because you can go back and look at your own work, you know, and you kind of start analyzing, what am I doing? Am I doing something, am I doing something right here? And what am I doing? And how can I get that idea across? So. When I, when I, 
if uh, some of these, the artists that have been in my classes, you know that I start with a tone drawing for most of my oil and pastel work, and then and I, I tone, I like to tone it red, and then we work, we start establishing our darks and work toward our lights with oil and pastel. So, so I think the easiest thing for any, any of us artists to do is to cover those darks up because you are adding your mid-tones and your highlights, so your natural tendency is to cover the darks up. So I try to, when I'm doing my own painting, I think, let me remind myself and check, check the process throughout the painting. Are the darks still there? Am I covering them up? Because the darks are really your foundation for your painting. And so I, that's my own uh, checkpoint with my own work is, are the darks still there? Because you know, if you paint them out, then your painting starts getting flat and, and the whole thing is just starts to just become one, one value, you know? So, so anyway, so I went back and I thought, if I'm gonna talk about this, let me try to put some paintings in here where I thought the darks were an important part of the painting. Some of the paintings are more dark oriented and then others I just think think of as, I try to strategically place the darks in there or have a reason for it. So this is kind of making me analyze my own work and think, well, why did I do this like this? Okay, let, let me try to explain it. So, so I put some of the, I've, I've done this series of jazz paintings really for fun. I started out doing these a few years ago and, and I thought if I got 25 or 30 done, I might have a show and I thought it would be fun maybe to go to a New Orleans or Chicago or try to you know get a real jazz city to sponsor it. But so far I've just, I've done about seven of these and then I've gotten distracted into other things. But so these are just kind of my paintings that, that, that I've done and, and these are jazz musicians I've admired and I've learned about, you know, so this, this is a sax player and this is an oil and I would say on this the darks you know I worked from an old photograph and there, there wasn't really anything in particular in the background I think it was a light background but I thought this I need to place some darks strategically you know near the, the light areas of his coat I even punched up the darks and, and the keys and the saxophone to try to give it more dimension, you know, more more contrast for, for impact. Even even under his hat, I remember I darkened the hat more so than the reference picture just to try to find key ways to punch those darks up to give it more more contrast and more interest. Here's a, here's a Dizzy Gillespie uh, pastel. Same thing, I tried to punch these darks up near this light coat. I tried to add color you know, to get these violets in, in, in the shadows of the jacket and um, so on. Here's John Coltrane, charcoal. So this one, to me, I think any good portrait, you've got to have a good range of values and good contrast. You know, when, when I've done portrait commissions, I think the greatest fear is you get a reference picture from somebody and it's a flat photo. You don't have good, strong contrast. And so you have to create them, I think, if they're not there. This reference picture was pretty good. It had the contrast there, so I tried to embellish them and, and, and uh, increase them even more. Um, this is a pastel of Miles Davis. It was an old photograph, and so I exaggerated the, the folds in the jacket, punched up the darker areas in the background. I wanted to contrast the mute on his trumpet you know, against the background. So I was trying to think, you know, think my way through this and find areas and make conscious decisions to, to let the shadows help work on, for the piece. Um, this was uh, the Preservation Jazz Band. Have you guys heard of them in New Orleans? Yeah. You know, I think they were the first jazz band to, to integrate and have black and whites in their band. And this, this band has been going on for 50, 60 years, I think. So this was a color photo I found in a magazine. In the photo, it had people sitting on the floor in front of them, and had some people back here. And I thought, well, there's that many musicians, I'm gonna try to simplify it. And then I'll, and I'll try to increase the darks a little more, you know, to create a little sense of mystery about it. And then like those guys on the far right, they're kind of, with the idea that these, when these uh, musicians 
pass away, then new guys step in, and it's been generations of new musicians staying in this band. So, so I was kind of trying to give a lost and found quality to those two guys on the right, and then and punch those darks up to try to create a little mystery about it, a little mood about it. Um, this this is a uh, sometimes I teach sky classes, and so I'm just showing a few examples tonight of, of how the process works when I work, try to lay these darks in and then layer with my red color. So there's a cloud study, and I'm, and I'm drawing the darks, and I'm kind of showing the highlighted areas of just the canvas. So here it is, I'll put a red wash on it, then I'll start with the darkest colors in the shadow, work my way toward the lightest, so there's there's one layer of color. Now this is where I'll let this this layer dry overnight. You know, I try to use liquid in the paint to speed up the drying. So once this is dry, then I'll do my final color over it. So to me, this gives me a it's kind of a security blanket where I got that first layer of color done. Now if I put my final layer of color over it, don't like it, I can wipe it off. I've still got this as my base painting. So there's the final cloud from, from this. So you see that, you know, it's important to have these darkest darks in there. If you get your darks dark enough, then you got a place to build. You can, you can work lighter colors on top. So generally I go lighter as I'm working toward the finish and usually the color palette goes warmer. So it'll be darker, cooler colors underneath and then lighter value and warmer colors to finish on top. Um, Here's, this is this piece over here that's on the easel. So I started with charcoal and then I put a red wash and then I'm painting. I, I, those of you who know me or been in classes, you know, I, I aim for like a purple blue mixture to try to get a lively shadow color going on underneath, whether it's oil or pastel. Um, trying to follow the impressionist ideas of having a lively shadow color in there. So that's, that's the start of that. And I started putting in the greens. And I start with the sky. So I would start with the darkest blue, work my way toward the lightest. So that the cumulus clouds, I haven't painted yet. That's still a red wash, so I'm working toward those. Now this painting, it was a photo I took down in, in Bluffton. And it had a typical Mars scene with cumulus clouds. And I, I liked the photo. So I thought, well, I'll make a good painting out of this. I just need to paint it like the photo, you know? Well, sometimes it doesn't happen. Sometimes your photo reference looks great. Even if your painting is a uh, mirror images, it may not be a good painting. But I still kept plodding ahead with this, thought it was okay. So there, I'm starting to cover up most of the reds. And when I got to this point, I realized this thing just doesn't have any oomph, you know, it doesn't have any drama, it's just a Mars scene with clouds. And, and I started feeling like the clouds were too busy and it was reminding me too much of the tree line. It was just a lot of little things going on that didn't seem to have any real impact. I found a photo later of a storm cloud and I thought, I saw that photo, I thought I'm going to drop that sky in there. It'll give it more contrast, more drama. So, so then what I had to do was I sanded that, that the oil out of the sky, re-gessoed re it, drew it in and re-redded it again. So I've got a red sky. So you see, then I started painting the darker blue in it that you see there. And there's the finish, there's the painting. You know, so to me, you tell me if you think this is better than where I was heading, you know, when I was Back there, it, it might have been a pleasant scene, but to me, it didn't really have any impact. So I felt like, I wish I'd figured it out sooner. <laughs> still, I guess as long as you get there, that's the important thing, right? Uh, here's a, uh, the only painting I've ever done at the Gervais Street Bridge. Uh, I did this and it got involved in an auction at Lexington Medical Center. So there was the start of it in charcoal. I'm paying particular attention to the darks with this, because this is, I was wanting to paint this like a twilight scene. So there's my red wash. I'm starting with the shadows, that purple blue tones in there. So when I, when I teach class and I, I'll say, I'd rather you overdo the shadows, you can always cover it with more intermediate color. 
But don't be timid with the shadows if you don't have enough darks. It's hard to put them in later on top of lighter color, you know. So I'm really trying to pay attention and get those shadows put in there. So here now I'm developing the sky in it. Now I'm getting my greens going in it and kind of saving the bridge for last. A little more refining with the, with the, the colors. And then let's we'll see. Okay. This step, then more refining, and then the final step. There's a the final painting. So, so again with that one, I'm, I remember, you know, asking myself throughout that whole painting process, are the shadows still there? If you covered them up, or they you still have that foundation in there, you know? So, because I think that's that's really important. Um, and here's a lot of times I, you know. If I start a painting that I know is going to be a full color painting, how many of you have taken your reference and Xerox copied it to have a black and white version to look at? And I think that's a good idea. So I did this as a pastel, as a kind of a warm up along that line, and I, and I was really trying to get those shadows in there and, and hold that image together, and then I later painted it again in color. So here's the painting. So to me, this this step helped me tremendously getting to, to this step, you know, to this painting. Here's another one like that. This is a, a Saluda River scene, charcoal, a little bit of pastel. Um, there's the painting, painting version of it. Um, and this this was up near Table Rock, a, a charcoal with a little bit of pastel in it. And after I did this, then I. I wanted to paint it and I decided I think I'm going to paint a vertical and use the right half of it and find a painting within a painting. So here's the painting I did. So, that, so I thought that was a better composition even though I like this okay I thought for the painting I thought the vertical version of it was a little better. What do you think? Yeah, you know? I like it. Uh, here's, a, here's a black and white. I did an oil, I just did it in tones of black and white. I actually did a painting later that, and I didn't like it as well as this. You know, sometimes the black and whites, as much as I love color, and I've kind of dedicated my career to, you know, painting in color, uh, I love black and white. And I think if you do some of this preliminary work in black and white, you really are working a lot of the problems out, you know, because you can paint any painting, any combination of colors, but you've got to get the values right. You know, I think that's the most important thing. You can you could do any combination of colors in that sky, but if you don't get your value relationships correct, color isn't going to save the painting, generally. Um, yeah, this was a pastel, and I call it limited color. I went in and just put a little bit of green-gray in the sky, and just, just to give it a little tease of color, instead of just a pure black and white. Here's another pastel, the same idea. But you see how in both of these, how important that black is and that, sh that shadow area in those grasses. You know, to me, it, 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 if I covered too much of that up, it just wouldn't have the, the strength of the, of the composition. Same thing with this one. The darks, I think, hold and give some weight to the bottom of the piece and kind of hold it together. And I just got that little bit of tease of color in there. That gray. This was a pastel I did years ago where I was just trying, I was on a, uh, a ferry boat, I think it was near Ocracoke, and I, that's what I saw past that little peninsula, and it just fascinated me, the light hitting the water. So I thought, well, how can I do a simple version? I think if I put full color to that, it wouldn't have been as effective as, as the limited color. This is that, this piece there. This, this was a Datal Island near Buford. Um, this, this, this tree really interests me, the, the, twisted, the, the twisted trunk on it. And I think at that time of day, it was the most interesting because you know, I really wanted to bring your eye to that light hitting that trunk. And I think the best way to do it is to surround it with the darks. I saw that tree earlier in the day, it had no, no appeal to me. It just, the tree was just the tree, you know. Late in the day, all of a sudden, that little light area right there just came alive. 
Uh, so I think the darks are, are very important with that one. Um, here's a, this is a pastel I did. Of, um, I was at uh, Yosemite in California. The, the photo reference I took, the area in the sky, it was a big granite cliff up there. You know, if any of you been to Yosemite, you know what it looks like down the valley and, and the Merced River, and then you're just surrounded by granite everywhere. But I thought it would make a more interesting painting to take that out, just give it a more of a, a universal appeal, like the painting could be anywhere. It could be Tennessee, North Carolina, or somewhere else in California. So, but this area, so I, I felt like the darks were, were, it needed the darks to surround, but I was trying to, to create the distance back there. So I created this little tree line of blue, which wasn't there in the reference. So to me, I'm always looking for ways to extend the picture plane. And especially on small paintings, I think if you can add another tree line, add, add something in the distance to create more interest and, and let the viewer go further back into the painting, I think it's, it's, it's a more effective <coughs> approach. Um, Here's a, here's a Chattooga River piece I did in pastel where so I exaggerated the darks in the water. Um, I wanted to really bring this this uh, tree trunk out and I like the way it, it, it sort of drove your eye down into the mist into the background. But I think if that was done with any less darks in it, it wouldn't have been as, uh, as an interesting painting. That's, there's the water lilies I brought tonight. Um, th this, uh, well, you really see the difference between the color on a TV and the real thing, right? You know, I've got a TV, when I, when I teach and travel, when I drive, I take a T, I've got a 32 inch television. So if the class is eight or 10 people, you know, they can all get close and, and we look at that and I've calibrated my TV to match my iPad, you know, you never, so you don't have that calibration option, you know, when you're just setting up to a TV. But um, anyways, what interests me about this and, and a lot of these water lily pieces, the water is so dark and the shadows you get are so dark and deep. And I just love the way all the, the uh, roots and, and, and everything just travels down, disappears into the water. So I think uh, these shadows to me were particularly interesting and I thought that was those darks if that if they that reflected shadow wasn't in the water I don't think the piece would have been nearly as effective um, there's there's that middle piece I brought the night in the middle that one and the same thing there I think that shadow if that shadow wasn't there I don't think it would be as interesting of a piece and what what I was particularly interested in were these little highlights right there on that shadow I thought just that little light hitting that it is, and that little little highlight right here. Those are the little things that I, I try to contrast that against the darkest darks, sort of strategically bring those those out, you know, to create a little more interest. Um, and here's another one where I, what, what interests me about this piece was the kind of the multi-layering effect of the shadows. You know, you've got your darkest shadow reflection here, and then you've got uh, other other things reflecting outside the picture plane. So you almost have a, a overlap of darks and shadows. Um, and the, the, just the dark water in general, you know, it, it's almost black. You know, if you've seen these water lilies, you know, it's, it's a little bit of color, but it's so, so dark. And then you got the color of the flowers contrasting it, so that's what really appeals to me about these water lilies. Um, and here's another one where, you know, I think the darks are important behind there. It contrasts with the flower, and then, you know, I think the challenge is to try to suggest detail in that shadow, but without really painting a lot of detail in it. To me, that's one of the things that, that keeps me fascinated about shadows and paintings. If you put too much detail in the shadow, it, 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 it commands too much attention, but you've got to have some suggestion of it so that, you know, your, your brain fills in the rest of it, you know, so it's stuff under the water in there I'm trying to show without getting in there and spending a lifetime doing it, you know. Um, 
here's another pastel I did. Of, these are uh, Damozel cranes, Asian birds that, that were in a, I think those, that was at, uh, it's an Audubon Zoo in New Orleans, I think is where that was. But, um, so I tried to punch up the darks in there to contrast against the, the, the silvery white of the, of the cranes. And then tried to keep the, the uh, shadows lined up with, with the darks and in between the palms. Uh, this piece, uh, I, did, I did this bird, this, this, um, this egret, it started out as a charcoal on a creamy paper. And when I did the original of it, I just had kind of like that, that piece that when I redid that one, that had the, the smaller cumulus clouds, you know. I had a similar thing going on in the background where I had a lot of pieces of clouds. And I thought that was what was gonna make a good painting, you know, and I got, and I finished the whole thing. And I even, I was, I was, I put it in a show, framed it and had it in this show in North Carolina. And no one paid it much attention to it. You know, it was one of those paintings where I got done with it and I said, well, it's done and, and, I, and I like it, darn it, you know. This, <laughs> it's a good painting and, and I'm done with it. You know? And how I many of you have done that, you know, where you're just so tired of the thing that you talk yourself into being done with it and you take it to the frame room. Well, well, I'm, it must be good because now I'm spending money framing it. You know, so. Anyways, and our, after I had it about a year or two, and I looked at it and I thought, oh, that, I like the bird, but it's just, the rest of it just doesn't have any contrast, any drama. It was too light, but I, I, I wish I had photographed it the way it looked. This is me putting in the background that I changed it to, but you can still see I hadn't worked on the bird yet. So there's the charcoal on the creamy paper. So imagine the rest of it was was just cumulus clouds during the day. The, the water, everything was different. The whole background was different. Well, I, I found this photo of that sky and all of a sudden I, I thought of this piece. I thought, I want to put that sky behind that bird. But how can I do it? How can I fit, you know, I, I, I like the bird, but I hate the rest of it, you know? What can I do? I thought, well, I'll spray fix it it was a charcoal drawing, so I'll spray fix it, and then I'll, I'll work pastel on top of it. So that's what I did. So there it is when I'm half done. You can even see here, there's, I'm working the pastel over that charcoal in the, in the creamy area, but so here's the fun. So you see that you know, I've caught up the rest of the bird with the pastel, and, uh, but I left, because of that creamy paper, see it coming through here in the grass and then I just put a tease of a little bit of orange in the beak just a little tease of color so it wouldn't just be black and white um, so finally I thought well now I like it now it has drama you know it has it took me about five I think this thing sat around for four or five years in its previous condition so I finally uh, worked over it and so Here's, uh, here's a piece that, a blue heron, and I, this is how I started that one. So there's the charcoal drawing of it. There's the red wash on top of it. Now I put the red wash to, to get a glow of color, you know. I, when I first, I, it, those of you who have taken classes with me, I've probably told this story before you've heard it, but I remember I was in Charleston at, at Spoleto, the outdoor festival in Marion Square. I saw this abstract painting from a distance. I was probably a hundred feet from it. I thought, man, that thing is something. What is it about that? It just it, was, it just popped, and it, and I got up close to it and looked at it. And I could see red underneath, and it was just a just a splash of color. It wasn't there was nothing realistic about the painting, but the colors all sort of held together with that red background. And then I thought, I'm going to go back and try that on my landscapes. And see if it works you know so that's what I started doing and I've been doing it ever since but anyways so there's the process of the red okay then I'm starting with my darkest color so I started with the grasses I always I always choose what to paint next based on what's the darkest what's what's the darkest thing I'm working on and then I work on the next darkest and the next darkest so I'm putting in the darks of the grasses I'm putting in darks of the, of the bird in the sky. 
Okay, so now I'm starting to put in some clouds, some lighter, lighter tones in there. So now it's starting to come. Um, I remember I kept working on the water. I kept thinking I was getting the water dark enough, but, but it, it needed to be a darker value. It didn't have enough weight and the, and the bird didn't seem to look right with that amount of, of light value in the water. So I'm taking a little further, but then here's the final step. So you see the difference. I think it's a stronger piece. It has more, more punch and more weight to the bottom of it than, that, than there. Plus it didn't, it didn't seem like there was enough contrast between the bird and the water. And so I, so I darkened it. And th these are what I call my pandemic series. You know, I started. <laughs> I was like, well, now I got all this time. I'm not teaching them at home. Maybe I'll try some, some, some birds. And, you know, th this whole idea started. Uh, uh, I'll go ahead and just tell on them anyways because they don't care. Lexington Medical Center called me several years ago and they said, we want to talk to you about doing some murals in our psych our psych ward, psych part of the hospital, because they can't have windows there, they can't have glass, you know, because of the patients and all that. And they said, it's really dark and drab down here and we need something to liven it up. And so I said, well, okay, are, are you talking to other artists too? Or are you just talking to me? No, we want you, we want to hire you to do this mural work. Well, what do you want me to do? Well, you just come up with some ideas. We don't know, you know, but okay. So I started thinking about it, I thought, well, maybe birds, tropical birds, you know, parrots or toucans, or that'd be kind of fun, and I'll paint them real bright and colorful, and, and I'll try to paint them so that I can paint them as a mural. I won't do all this blending of color, I'll just have more shapes, separated shapes of color. So I spent, I developed all these sketches and everything and took them in there, you know, and they're like, we, we love it do it give us a, give us the final cost on you know we want this wall that wall this wall you know they gave me all the parameters everything so I came up with the price and, and I was expecting maybe they say well we don't want to pay to spend that much or we don't want maybe maybe we'll cut down and we'll just do half the walls or you know whatever you know you're kind of expecting some adjustment you know so, so after I did all that and sent it in there and then the response was well we, we can't do the mural project now because now we're not going to, we're going to move. We're not going to be in the same part of the hospital. Are you kidding me? It's like, when did you find that out? Like, so they, they, they paid me for, for some of the time I spent, but I was so disappointed because I was all jacked up to do these murals, you know? And so I've kept this idea, you know, on the back burner and I thought, maybe, maybe I'll paint these paintings, I just say it won't be murals, but I'll, I've got all these birds, but maybe I'll try to do them a little more of, of separated color, you know, a little more posterized, or that was one of them, and so you see I tried to, you know, put the darks in, and then, you know, where the, like the orange changed, you know, it's more, it's less blended, but, you know, I thought I could probably get away with that, that, that approach with this subject matter. So I did these in pastel, and I, and I started experimenting on that UART paper, that sandpaper, which holds a lot of pastel, and, and so you can really get some rich color and build up with it. But I thought the darks, you know, when you put these birds in their own environment, it's a lot of jungle, a lot of darks, and you know, there's a lot of shadow colors, a lot of deep colors. So I thought this would be a good one to kind of do that way. So you see the other other two. There, there's the one there I brought in. Uh, so this uh, scarlet macaw, I always always wanted to paint that bird, you know, and I so I took the the darks that were in it and then exaggerated them and kind of instead of softly blending them, I kind of just let them be spotted, and then I try to keep the dark the darks in the background strong, and also uh, one one thought that went through my mind doing this. Uh, it's like the color red, you know, when you try to make something look really red, and if you, how many of you have been down this road before with red, 
I think everybody has. You think, well, I'm going to lighten this red, make it look really highlighted and, and snappy and bright. And so you mix white in it, and, and you get this dull pink, right? This dead. And what I've learned about red is that you have to surround it with other with dark color, because red on, out of the tube is almost as light as it gets. You could put a little orange in it to keep the intensity of the red, but but you really can't do much with white and red. You know? So I was especially thinking, so I tried to place those darkest darks above his head, those, those uh, purples and blues and, and tur dark turquoise greens. So there was a strategy of about placing those colors to make that, that bird pop and make that red really pop. What I like about that in particular, because I've done some parrots too, is you've got the bird, it's like hard edges, the bird really stands out, and then you have your background very soft and yeah. almost muted in some areas, nice. and it really makes well, your eye focus on the bird. Yeah, because when I, if I had done that as a mural, I, I might have had it, I might not have had it as soft back here, mm -hmm. so, but I was still trying to keep that idea, keep it a little more posterized looking, but, but I remember when I got to that thought process, I thought, I'm going to keep more edge in contrast to the birds, and I'll, and I'll try to, where the colors meet, I'll try to blur the edges more in the background. You know, one thing I've learned about painting, and it seems like when, when I have beginners in classes, everybody's trying to get everything to look like like the photo. You know, I want this thing to look just like this, and, and they're just working so hard to get it so perfectly matched, you know. But artists don't think about that's the beginning artists about edges, you know, about hard edges or soft edges, and I try to, along with this dark obsession I have with, you know, <laughs> not being scared of the darks when you're painting, but I try to get this edge idea across where you can do, you can draw the, the viewer's eye wherever you want to go in your painting, wherever you've got the most contrastive edge or the most contrastive color, that's where you're going to look, you know, if you've got things blurred, softer less contrasty, that's going to be your background, you know, so, so I try to, you know, go over the edge idea too, and these were, I think, a good example, I appreciate you commenting about that. Um, there's the other one that I've got brought here, um, so same thing, in fact, I, this is one of those, I, I finished it, and I said, well, this one's done, and I like it, Please. darn it, <laughs> and then I realized that those leaves in the background were too edgy. I had them almost the same amount of edge as the bird. And so I went back and blurred and softened more of that pastel work. I even took it to my framer and he started framing it. And I called him up, I said, are you finished framing it yet? He said, yeah. I said, okay, I'll come over there. I'm gonna take it out of the frames. Because I've been sitting at home obsessing about my edges. And I know those, those edges on those leaves are too sharp. I can see it from my house, even though <laughs> so I went back, got it, took it out of the frame, you know, and he's the framer's like, okay, that's about right for you, you know, I understand. But then when I got it done, it's like, okay, I like it better. I think it works better now. And you know, you try so hard to, to not figure it out later, you know, but I swear, how I many years I've been doing this. Some things you just don't figure out till later. You know, you, you, even though you're reminding yourself the whole time, edges, color, darks, blah blah blah. You know, you still fall into that trap, right? I guess your brain just sort of fades out. I don't know, but anyways, I guess as long as. It, but there's some paintings I've been wanting to. I've sold. I think if I could just get that back from that guy. <laughs> I, I've been thinking about it. Three years ago, I sold that painting, but I bet I could make that, that background a little bit. You know, it's like, and and some artists understand. Of course, non-artists think it's crazy. You know, but, but here's another one. I would I, I included this in this presentation because I was thinking. You know, I think another thing that the. the beginning artists forget sometimes is is the darks that you put in the shadows are going to be darker and more contrasty up close so the, the shadows in that vegetation there is a lot darker than then there would maybe be the same shadow that far back but you, you do what you put more blue and white in your mixture you want it chalkier you want to put it in the distance you know so 
but that contrasty dark shadow is going to be what people look at. So that's in the foreground. So you know you can you can kind of keep control of your painting that way. But I'll see artists, and I've done it. I'm sure plenty of times. You get too dark with those shadows and those colors in that background, and you lose your distance in your depth in your painting. You know, so so I try to always be aware of that. You know, how can I create more distance, and what what do I have to do with my colors? and my darks and my lights to accomplish that. So um, this is that piece there that I brought in. This is a lagoon at Hunting Island. Have you guys seen that? How many of you have been to Hunting Island? You know? um, but uh, I guess what, what I heard years ago is they created that lagoon, they dredged the, the sand out of that and then build it up on the beach side to preserve the beach, which is eroding heavily. But, but that lagoon has always been fascinating for me. In fact, I don't know how many of you know this, but part of the Forrest Gump movie was filmed in that lagoon. Remember when Forrest was bringing Lieutenant, Lieutenant Dan, Bubba Gump, he was rescuing him during the artillery attack. He was laying them down on the sand. You know, it was, it was right, right there at that lagoon. I remember I just painted my first painting of that Lagoon, and then the movie came on, and I'm like, I've been there. I've stood there. I stood there and photographed and painted the Forrest Gump. I was there. People go, Yeah, sure you were. Sure you were. Anyways, this I had reference earlier in the day, and so I had to imagine what is it, what would that look like. I'm trying to create a twilight painting. So how dark can I make those darks? You know to, to tell that story um, and I think that again you get into that intrigue at least for me of suggesting some detail in that in those darks without overly painting it you know you want you want to make the viewer realize there's something back in those bushes but I'm not really sure what it is but you want to create something in there so it looks convincing that that's in the shadows in the distance um, so but and this, I, I had a sky reference, but I had no reference for the water. So I had to imagine how it would reflect in the water. And one of the, the handout I gave you, I'm gonna talk a little bit about that at the end of this presentation. But that band of yellow in the sky generally would reflect less colorful and a value darker in the water. There's kind of some rules I've, I've paid attention to. If you wanna call them rules, every rule can be broken. But I think there's certain ways that, that color reflects in water, and if you understand how that normally behaves, your paintings will be better off for it. So anyways, I'll explain more of that later. Um, here's a, this was a photo I took of Kiowa Island, and I decided I, I liked the photo, but I wanted to, to represent it as a later, later in the day, like a twilight painting. So I decided I'm gonna put a moon in it. And then I had to figure out, well, how dark Am I going to make that landmass because this was probably three or four o'clock in the afternoon, and I'm trying to create a twilight thing. So here's the painting. So I had to figure out and get guess in my mind. Well, how dark? You know, how am I going to change that to 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 you know make it maybe four hours later? You know. Um, so and that's that's the moon back there. So this the sun is still. The setting sun is still lighting up the scene from the front end, even though the moon is rising. Um, I, one time I went over to the um, astronomy department at USC. I was talking, I was fascinated with moon rising, sun setting, you know, what happens, you know? When the moon comes up, does that mean the sun is setting exactly the same, you know? And, and I learned it does, the moon does rise exactly when the sun sets, but how can you have still light from the sun? Then, if the moon is up in the sky, how does that? And the astrology guy told me, showed me, he said, because of the refraction, the, the way the light bends, you can still, the, the earth is still receiving some sun, direct sunlight, even though the moon's already up. Because I didn't want to paint something that couldn't be realistic, it couldn't happen. You know? So, it's part of the obsession of being an artist. Um, this was another moon piece of the pastel of Hunting Island. Uh, same thing, I shot it a little earlier in the day, and then I 
my challenge to myself is creating that twilight version of it where you got the moon. Um, and this is an Edisto piece that that I was, uh, again, I, I, I found a different sky that I decided to put in there. I, I photographed the, the uh, marsh late in the day, but I wanted to create that, that, that sky behind it. And then I found that reference to the sky, and then I had to imagine what the water would look like. So uh, that's, that's kind of, I guess, from the days when I illustrated years ago and did magazine work and ad agency work, you'd get these assignments, and sometimes they're pretty wacky assignments and challenging assignments. So I still like to give myself sort of an assignment now, you know, when I'm painting. Like, well, let me, I like this, but I want the time of day to be different. What can I do, and how can I make that convincing, you know? Um, so that's some of the some of the process there. But again, it's like the, the darks. I want to suggest things in there, but but you really can't detail it any more than is really there. It won't look even to an untrained eye to somebody who's not an artist. They'll say, well, something's wrong with that. I don't like that. You know, they won't know why. But if you didn't do your job right, that's, you know, somebody's going to be confused about it. But again, there, the darks there, I find, reflect slightly lighter in the water. And I'll talk about that with this, with this last piece. Um, this, this was a uh, painting, a pastel idea of the Broad River. It's where, you know, where the old prison is, and then you walk along the Broad River there. Um, I'd walked past that area earlier in the day, and it had no interest to me that the, the, the sun was high in the sky and the shadows weren't very interesting. And, and then on my return trip back at the end of the day, all of a sudden it was backlit. And then these shadows, these darks, became much more important and interesting to me in the piece. So I went ahead and, and uh, did that painting. But I, again, I think if, if that amount of dark it wasn't there like it was earlier in the day. I don't think it would have been a particularly interesting painting or subject to paint. Uh, this was Hunting Island, a, an oil painting I did. And I've, I've painted this several times. And I've dropped in different skies in there. And But the photo I took of it, it was it was kind of a half cloudy day. It wasn't, the light wasn't that strong. So I tried to exaggerate and I pumped up this shadow more because I thought that shadow was one of the more interesting things about that scene. Um, what, what I'm always interested in are things that are shadowed in your painting, but you can't see what's doing the, the shadow. The object is outside the picture plane, but you see the shadow in the painting and then you have to imagine, well, what, what's doing that? What did that thing look like outside that picture plane that creates that shape? You know, I think that's what makes it gets the viewer more involved, you know, like, I wonder what that is, or I know what that is, you know. Um, but, but that one, I thought the darks were important, you know, that I underpainted it with my red I put in there, and so really the, the light of the, the ocean water is really just the underpainting. And so I think with that underpainting idea, a lot of times it's kind of the lazy, lazy man's way because some of that color is your final color. You know, so maybe you don't have to do as much painting as, as people think, you know, because you're relying on that underpainting to do some of the work. So, but I, but I remember thinking, how dark do I need to make that ocean water to give it contrast to this piece of sand and still look like ocean to me. That when you get those dark tones in the water, it's, it's powerful looking and interesting looking. So, and the darks in the trees, I wanted to make sure I kept those. I remember painting those trees. I thought, well, I'm going to put greens and golds and different colors in that top of that palm, but I don't want to lose that dark up there because I think that's what's holding that palm tree together with the darks in there. But the easiest thing to do is to cover them up, you know, because that's what you're doing. You're adding mid-tones and highlights. So, so that would be one of those paintings where I'd say, okay, are the darks still there? You know, are they still working? This was an older piece I did uh, that I printed. And uh, I remember when I, f I photographed this area, and this was one of the things that, that, that almost had the perfect reference. And usually I don't find that, you know, but I thought I love this reference. I think if I can just paint it 
like this would be a good painting, but the bird wasn't there. The bird was, I think the bird was over here somewhere in the, in the reference. And I thought, now this is gonna be important. I gotta place this bird in the right place. And, and he was kind of in the center of the picture and he was in a place where it wasn't that contrasty. So I, I thought, with well, just that white shape, where am I gonna put it? So I thought I'll put it right at the, at the end of that peninsula at that point. And then I'll surround it with some of the darkest darks. And, and I worked really hard to keep these darks in there to show that low tide situation with that fluff mud, you know. And I thought if I, if I don't, if I stray away from having those darks in there, it won't, it won't have the impact, you know. Because when you're down that low country, that fluff mud in those areas of shadow can really be dark, you know. So I was trying to keep it authentic, but put put that bird shape uh, in the in the right place. And if you notice the bird, I talk about light areas reflecting in water. Usually, lights reflect a little darker. So if you say you had a a, a white hull of a sailboat in a marina, and that white, say that white hull represents one in a value scale, being white one, it's gonna reflect probably a two or three in the water. It might be a warm gray in the water. Light areas reflect a little darker. If that same hull of that boat had a black stripe on it, and say that black stripe would be a 10 in the value scale, being black, that stripe in the water is going to be broken. It's probably going to be about an eight. It might be a dark gray. So the values narrow in the water. So even with that egret, see the reflection? It's a, it's a value darker than the actual shape of the bird above the water. I think those are things that, that you got to get those little things right, or it's, or there's something going to be wrong with the painting. And and you know your average guy will say that doesn't look right. I don't like it. You know you don't know why I don't like it, but. You know. Now here's another uh, pastel. I did the other one first, and then this was Kiowa. But again, I I moved the bird so the bottom half of him would would reflect against that darkest dark down in that fluff mud area. So I was trying playing around strategically and trying to get those contrasts and keep those darks in there. But also that I wanted to keep the darks darker here, and you don't want those shadows as dark in the background. If you do, it's, you're going to lose your distance, you know. So I tried to have a couple values lighter and, and bluer. So even with pastel, you know, I'm, I'm adding more blues and lighter tones to it than I would down here. Uh, and this is an oil painting that, um, that where I felt like that I needed to keep these these waves dark and keep some weight to the bottom of the painting. <coughs> keep my contrast strong at the bottom where that cloud is going to be a couple of values lighter that kind of uh, burgundy color would be lighter than the darker darks in the water uh, so now I'm at this last piece so if you if you'll take a look at your uh, handout I did this was an old painting I did years ago the Congre River and um, you know, I remember I was, I was getting ready to teach a class at Huntsville Museum of Art, and it was a four-day class. And so I had a lot of time for demoing and, and explaining of things, you know. And so I, and I was thinking about, I think the class was, was talking about reflections in the class. And I thought, you know, let me try to put down in steps what, how, what, what my approach is to reflections. Because I guess you know you learn these things over a period of time, but you often don't really think about them. What are they? What are the steps? Or what are the rules? So I thought I'm going to try to put five different sort of uh, observations, I guess, if you will, about how I approach reflections. And uh, so the first thing I'm talking about is regarding value. Darks generally re reflect lighter in water. So like if you take the, you know, you take this picture. A lot of times, if you just view the painting or the photo, whatever you're looking at, because you're looking at the scene, you may not really notice it and break it down the same way. But turn it sideways, look at the darks in the trees above the water line, and look look at the darks in the water. <laughs> or you turn it upside down, you can see it too. 
the darks aren't as dark in the water, they're not reflecting as dark as they are above the waterline. The uh, uh, two, the second one, regarding value, lights generally reflect darker in the water. So, like, look at the yellow trees up there, look at the rocks, and, you know, turn the thing sideways or upside down, look at the difference. There, there are a couple, of that, that yellow is a couple of values darker in the water than it is above. But if you just look at the scene, you might not see that because you're, you're really looking at the picture. But, but I'll take these references I work from, I'll turn them sideways and upside down, and I try to see the difference. So I paint the difference when I'm painting it. Um, uh, three, I talk about the amount of detail and sharpness of edges are more defined in areas above the waterline. So anything you see above the waterline, those branches, the leaves, you're going to see less distinction of shape. It's going to be more blurred in the water. A lot of times I'll see beginner uh, painters and they paint something that looks almost the same in the water. There's hardly any difference. And we've all seen photo reference on a still day. You know, if there's no wind blowing and if the water is shallow, you'll see almost a complete mirror image in the water of what's reflecting. And you'll accept it as a photograph because, you know, you know it's a photo. And so, well, that's, well, I'm going to paint it like that because, by God, there it is. It looks just <laughs> like that in my photo. You know? But if you paint it that way in your painting, it's, it's not going to, you know, now viewers are looking at your painting, it's a painting. And people are much more critical about a painting than they would be a photo. Because a photo, it had to be like that. It, it's a, it's, there's a picture of it, it looks just like that. You know? But what are you going to do with your painting if, if you're having your painting in a show and you hear some guy go, look at that, that doesn't look right. That, that water looks the same, the reflection of it looks the same as it does above it. What are you going to pull your photo out of your pocket and go, look, look, see, I painted it just like that. <laughs> So I try to, if I find a photo that's interesting me to paint, and it's, and it's two mirror image, then I try to blur the distinction and make it more blurred. Also, the uh, number four, I talk about hues of color are generally more saturated and intense above the waterline. So you can see that yellows, oranges, reds are much more muted in the water reflection than they are above the waterline. And I'll often see paintings like that where, where artists are painting reflections and they got the colors just as bright in the water as, mm -hmm. as it is above the water line. Now, I have seen instances where it is that bright, but generally it, it, it goes this way. And I think, again, that idea of you accept it in the photo, you know, I've, I've, I've seen like red boat, red boats that reflect just as red in the water. And maybe it really was that way. And maybe the photo shows it that way. If you paint it that way, it's probably not gonna look right. You know, so I try to think that way about it when I'm approaching reflections. And then this last thing, five, skies generally become warmer in hue toward the horizon uh, and often warmer above the waterline. So it's kind of subtle here, but as the sky, if those trees weren't there and you saw more of the horizon, you see how the sky tends to get a little lighter and warmer, that blue, so if you're mixing that with paint, say if that was cerulean blue up there, you'd add some white and maybe a touch of yellow to it to warm it up to the horizon. And I've noticed on, on days where the sky, you might have a cerulean blue sky, you know, that a clear cloudless day. Generally that blue reflects a value darker in the water and it also reflects cooler. So you might put like more ultramarine blue in your mixture and then maybe add, add a, a little bit of color to darken the value of it too. So next time you're, you're looking at a, at a scene like that, like I'll tell artists in my classes, you know, uh, when I first, years ago, I first started painting landscapes, you know, I'd see something and, and uh, oh, oh, that's an interesting area, I wanna, I wanna paint that and, and clicking here and clicking there and, and going over here, I'll get this angle and that angle and, you know, I'm just, I'll, I'll, I'll figure it out when I get back to the studio which one I'm going to paint, you know, click, 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 click. 
Now what I do is I'll study it and I'll say what's the best angle I'm interested in here painting it. I'll force myself to make the decision when I'm out the field. So if I see, okay, this angle straight on is the most interesting angle, let me take a picture of it and then instead of spending 15 more minutes running around clicking all these other shots of it, I'll stand there and, and look at it and I'll study it and I'll, I'll, I'll study the shadows. How dark are those shadows? How much information can I see in those shadows? So I get my picture back in the studio, the shadows are probably gonna go pretty black. So I'm trying to study the scene and I'm, and I'm in my mind I'm thinking, okay, that, that those trees in the background, what color am I gonna to mix to paint those? Is that gonna be sap green with some yellow ochre in it? Is it gonna be, I'm, I'm already thinking while I'm there, of, I'm trying to make painting studio decisions about what color am I gonna mix? And this is what I do now. I try to memorize the scene and start trying to break down how I would paint it with, and what colors I would use instead of running around like a chicken with his head cut off photographed in between different angles. And you'd be amazed if you do that, how you'll retain that. And the more you do that, you'll, you'll get better at it. So when you're back in the studio, all of a sudden in your mind, you know, I remember now that, that chat, those shadows were, they weren't that dark. And I'm remembering that now because I stood there and studied them for 15 minutes. So, so that's something I, I tend to do more of now. It, I try to keep things simple and then try to make that, that decision when I'm there. Because if I don't return to that area again, I'm, I'm back in the studio with, with a picture of it. And then I've got whatever I've tried to maintain up here, you know, to, to remember it. Um, so, so that's, that's it. That's what I got.